Let's give Brett a warm welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you all. You can hear me fine, it sounds like? Great. Um, how are you all feeling? Like, it's good to be here, right? Like, I know it's a little bit, yeah, thank you. Um, I know it's a little bit of that po post-lunch lull and we're heading into the break. You're thinking about your next coffee. Uh, I am too, uh, after I get off the talk nerves. Um, but so since Josh introduced me so well, I won't belabor the point. Uh, if you want to follow along with the slides on this talk uh, for accessibility reasons or just because, I've got a QR code uh, that'll take you right there. Uh, just point your mobile device toward the front of the room and scan it, and you'll be able to head right there. So to give a bit of background, uh, Josh mentioned that I work on a lot of technical projects. So like I've been, uh, I love Python. I work with Python a lot. Uh, one pattern I find myself implementing a lot is uh, I write a lot of command line tools for people, uh, people who aren't me always. Uh, so I need to think a little bit about how to make them user friendly and accessible. Uh, and when I start, usually I start by trying to write a shell script. Uh, how many of you all have written a shell script or at least are familiar with the concept? Okay, so a good, a good number. So hopefully, hopefully this will be a useful talk for all of you. Um, shell scripts are really handy. Like when you have tools that um, input and output formats that you need, uh, it's very easy to set them up to, to talk to each other seamlessly and get a useful result that you want. Um, and typically, we do that with shell pipelines. So if you're not familiar with that terminology, we can walk for you if, through a few examples. Uh, pipe, shell pipelines are literally indicated with the pipe character uh, in between two commands. And it means take the output of the command on the left and make it the input of the command on the right. So some examples of pipelines you might see commonly uh, like here, here's probably the first one that everyone learns, right? Like take the ls command that lists files and pipe it into less so that I can scroll through the list and actually uh, read it at my leisure rather than having it go whoosh like all the way down my terminal real fast. Uh, so so that's, a, that's a pipeline. We take the output of ls, which is just a plain text list of files, and, and make it the input of the less command, which then gives us an interface to, to scroll through it. Another, another common one uh, that's often taught to beginners is doing, like if you've got a tar archive, it's usually compressed in some way, right? And so what we can do is we can run that file through the decompression tool, which might be zcat or bzcat or xzcat, uh, and then feed the resulting output into the tar extraction command or the tar list command so that we can see uh, what's inside that file. Uh, but we can do more sophisticated things, right? Like, like it doesn't just have to be one command on the input, one command on the output. We can keep doing this. Uh, so, so here's a personal pipeline that I use uh, every now and then to publish like lightweight web pages. Um, there are command line tools called Smarty Pants and Markdown. Markdown does what you think it does. It takes um, a Markdown formatted input and gives you HTML on the output. And so that's how you sort of render the markdown. Uh, Smarty Pants just adds like nice formatting to that, so m dashes, uh, proper curly quotes, things like that. Uh, and so one pipeline I've written occasionally is to just take a markdown file, pass it through Smarty Pants, pass it through Markdown, uh, and that'll give me like a nice chunk of HTML, right? Uh, and then I can use the cat command, which concatenates files or inputs uh, to take an HTML header that HTML chunk that I got out of Markdown and an HTML footer and conglomerate it all into a single HTML page that's ready for serving. Um, if you want to write blog posts but you don't actually have set up a blog yet, this is a great way to do it. <laughs> um, or at least it's convenient. Uh, and so like, it, if you've got tools that, that you can chain together like this, like you can do some very powerful things. Uh, Here's an example of a kind of pipeline I've written in the past. I'm not going to step through every technical detail of it, but uh, what it's saying is go through a source directory recursively, find all the files with extension PDF or ODT, so basically documents, uh, and print out a list of them. And then we're going to turn that list into arguments for CP, the, the copy command, 
and copy them recursively into a destination directory. And so what this is going to do is, is recursively search a source directory, find all the documents in it, and copy them all into a single target directory, uh, whether for reorganization or backup or, or whatever purpose you need. Um, that's a very high-level concept to express in just like a single shell pipeline like this, right? Like this is a lot of power. Um, it, it's really like you can do some pretty impressive things uh, if, if you're handy with the shell. But one limitation of the shell is that what what this what these pipelines rely on is that uh, the output of one tool and the input of another tool are formatted the same way. And in fact, there, there's a little bit of like almost cheating going on in this last pipeline. You see here this print zero argument to find, and then this xargs dash zero. Basically, these two flags cause finds output to be compatible with xargs as input. Like we're kind of having to tell them to talk to each other correctly. Um, and if you don't use these flags, like bad things can happen. If your PDF file names have like spaces or new lines or other unusual characters in them. Uh, so it's important to include them. And so, so one issue I run into when I start writing shell scripts like this occasionally is, is I'll have like an impedance mismatch in my pipeline. Like one tool will output YAML and I'll need to like do a little bit of manipulation on that or selection on it and then feed it as input to something else. And this is where I start really bumping up against the limits of shell scripting, right? Because shell scripts, like, like uh, arrays are awkward to work with and hashes are completely non-standard, uh, dictionaries as we would call them in Python. Uh, and so it can be difficult to like, you know, here's a task where like, oh, if I just had this, I could parse this YAML in Python, it would be really easy, it would give me a dictionary, I could just do my selection there with a dictionary comprehension, and then feed it as the input to another thing. Uh, that, that can be kind of difficult to do with shell. So it's like, well, it'd be really nice if I could take the power of these pipelines and have it in Python. Fortunately, you can. Uh, so here's how you can take a shell pipeline and write it in Python. And I'm going to use one of the examples from the previous slide, the, the tar extraction one. Um, so there's a subprocess module in the standard library. You can import it right now. Uh, and it, it, uh, you can create popen objects out of it. Uh, and popen basically represents a running process. Uh, and and uh, I encourage you to refer to the, the documentation, because popen actually takes a lot of different arguments to control exactly how you want to run this process. One thing you can do is you can take the different file descriptors that every process has, the standard input, output, and error, and determine how they get redirected. And if you uh, say that you want to redirect something with the pipe constant out of the subprocess module, what happens is this popen object that you get back will have an attribute that is a file-like object that you can read or write uh, depending on which file descriptor it is. Uh, and so this is saying start the xz cat command with whatever other arguments my script was given, uh, and then give me the standard out in a file object. So here's an example so where I'm sort of like mixing my shell command in my Python data structures, right? Like I'm taking a list of arguments that I got from the outside world and I'm using them as arguments to xzcat. Now, this, this, is, this is very simple. This is something we could do in shell. You know, we're just like passing more arguments. But this list could be, instead of being argv, it could be a list I got from a YAML data structure or JSON or, or some other more sophisticated data manipulation that I did in Python uh, could just as easily go there. And so this is the, already a good example of how I can sort of mix and match these things. So once I've got this standard out file object on my xz proc popen object, uh, to, to set up the pipeline, all I have to do is start another process, in this case tar. So there's the command for tar. And I'll, again, I'm going to set one of its file descriptors. But instead of setting it to a pipe, I'm just going to pass it the file object that I already have uh, from the previous process. And so this is literally what a pipeline is, right? We're taking the input of one command, or excuse me, the output of one command and making it the input of the next. And that's, you can literally see that reflected here. This is the output of the first command. It is the input of the second. 
Uh, and this is a very efficient way to do it. Like when you do it this way, um, there, Python doesn't deal with the data being passed in between your two commands at all. They go directly. You're not introducing any overhead or anything like that to the data processing. Uh, and popen objects are context managers, so we can put them in a with statement. Uh, and as usual, you know, once the with block finishes, um, Python will like wait for the process to finish, clean up all your file handles, stuff like that, take care of all the cleanup for you without you having to worry about it. So if you wanted to do some additional interaction here, like print out a progress bar or something like that, you could do it inside this block. But if you just want to wait for your pipeline to finish, you can just say, with my pipeline, pass, and you'll just wait for it to finish. Uh, one slight tricky thing to note here, note that they're in reverse order from the way the pipeline would be written. So we have the last process in the pipeline first, and then the first process last. That's because, remember, context managers create a stack. And so when, we, when the with block finishes and we unwind that stack, we're going to wait for this process first, which is what we want, because it's first in the pipeline, and then this one. So that's why it's, that part's slightly counterintuitive, but it, it makes sense if you think through how context managers work. So that's pretty straightforward, right? Like, that's a nice, clean way that we can write shell pipelines in Python. Um, so I have to make a quick aside here. Someone in the audience is chomping at the bit right now. And they want to tell me, you don't have to pipe xzcat into tar. Modern tar already knows how to decompress its input, <laughs> and we don't have to run a second command. And yes, you are correct. Absolutely, that is true. Um, I want to work with this as an illustration, because it's a relatively simple pipeline, and I think a lot of people are familiar with the tools involved. Um, odds are like you know tools that you often use in shell pipelines that you could use a technique like this for, but they tend um, it's difficult to find a set of tools to use as an example that everybody can use as a reference point. So uh, that's why I've stuck with XEcat and tar is because those are very common tools. Um, but don't literally do this, please. <laughs> uh, you don't need to. Just, just say tar x and you're good. OK, so when, we're, so when we're writing shell pipelines in a shell script, when we're like chaining these things together, one neat feature of shell scripts is that right at the top, you can say set dash e. And what this means, if you're not familiar with it, it checks the return code of every program that you run inside the shell script. And as soon as one of them fails, it stops the shell script and, and do doesn't continue unless you specifically added some error handling to deal with that case. So this is a really nice safety feature to make sure that like, the shell script doesn't continue on um, after execution stops making sense. It's actually very similar to the way that you know, we're very big on having exceptions in Python uh, stop the execution of your program if something unexpected happens. Uh, set dash E is really similar to that, too. And so you might want to do this for the programs that you're invoking from Python. You might want to be able to say, if, if one of these fails, like I'm not going to be able to do anything else, so stop. And if you ask around, if you search around on the web, like how can I do that, you'll find really quickly, they'll tell you, oh, uh, the subprocess module has functions for that. You can just say subprocess.run with the check equals true argument. Or if you're using an older version of the subprocess module, you it has a function called check call. Um, and what that does is it waits for the program to finish, and then it uh, checks the return code. And if uh, it wasn't successful, i.e., if it wasn't zero, um, the subprocess module will raise an exception for you. But that's kind of tricky, right? Because wait, wait, we're waiting for the process to finish. But the whole point of a shell pipeline is that you've got two processes running simultaneously, one providing input for the other. So we can't afford to wait for a process to finish. So how can we get the best of both worlds here? How can we have our popen objects, which let us uh, pipe processes together while still having error checking? It's about a three-line subclass. Uh, so you will have to like, add this to your own script. But all you have to do is make a very uh, quick uh, extension to the wait method of subprocess.popen. So all popen objects have a wait method, which does exactly what you think it does. It waits for the underlying process to finish, and then it returns the return code of that process. And so what we can do is we can override that method to say, uh, call, call the original wait method of popen objects, and so it returns the return code. If that's not zero, 
raise an exception, uh, just like subprocess.run would. Uh, and if we were successful, we'll just return the return code just like the original wait method would, so we stay API compatible. So that's like something that's pretty simple. You can drop that into your script pretty easily. And then once you have that, for, for any pipeline where you want to be doing this kind of error checking, instead of saying subprocess.popen, you just say checked popen, and that's it. That's literally the only thing that's different about this entire block of code. Um, so you might be wondering, well, wait, where does the error checking happen? It happens right here. Uh, remember how I mentioned that the context manager waits for the underlying subprocess to finish? It does that by calling the wait method. So implicitly, uh, your context manager is calling the error handling code that we added uh, through this, this method. And so that way, that lets you just write your error checking code once. Uh, and then like, very easily adapt it into the rest of your script where you're already writing these pipelines. So that's pretty nice. So once we've got that, how does error reporting handling, or how, how do we report the errors that we get or that we catch with set-e or with our new wait method? So in a shell script, you kind of don't really have any error reporting, but it kind of works out. <laughs> because normally what happens is like if a tool like tar or xzcat encounters an error, it'll print an error to its standard error file descriptor. The user will see that, and then your shell script will stop. So hopefully, normally, the last thing they'll, your user will see is the error message that came from the underlying tool. And hopefully, that's helpful enough that they can do something with it. Unfortunately, not always true, but you know, like it, it, it's a start at least. Um, so if, if, we, if we've adapted this in Python, like let's say, for example, that so we, we've got our tar extraction pipeline in Python. Let's say the user gives it something that isn't actually a tar file. Uh, the output will typically look like this. So just like a shell script, on the standard error, you'll get an error from tar where it's explaining that it can't actually extract this thing. So far, so good. Then you get about eight lines of Python traceback from where we raised the exception uh, that we caught when we did our error checking after the fact. Uh, so this does tell the user what went wrong, but like this is a lot of bleh. Like the user can't really do anything with most of this information, even if they're familiar with Python, even if they're familiar with their script, i.e. its future you. Um, <laughs> This is a lot of information to parse through to like, understand what actually went wrong, that you used the tool incorrectly, that you can do something about right now to fix. So is there something we can do about this to improve this error reporting? Uh, there actually is. So if you've seen a lot of these tracebacks, uh, have you ever asked yourself, where does, where does this printout come from? Like, what, what prints out this traceback that tells me where the exception came from in my script? Uh, it's built into Python, uh, but it's also customizable. What Python does is it calls a function sys.accepthook from the sys module uh, to do exactly this kind of error reporting. And so when you start Python, this function is the function that prints out this traceback with all of this information. But if you want to customize it, you can just set a different function as sys.accepthook. So here's an example of one custom accept hook you might write for yourself. So every accept hook takes three arguments, the exception type, the exception value, which will normally, in modern Python, be an instance of exception type, uh, and then a, a very specific traceback object that has the details of everything that happened leading up to this exception. And so what we can do, like in the simplest case, you can simply like check the exception type and see if it's a kind of exception that normally indicates that the user made a mistake or, or that it, it's some problem with the user's input, and then just generate a custom error message accordingly. Uh, so what this one does is it looks at a couple different exception types. So if it's called process error, uh, we can just, we'll grab an error message that's like just the exception string but without the entire trace back, because that, that's useful. We can give the user that. Uh, if we get a keyboard interrupt exception, usually because the user hit control C, at the terminal, we'll just say, OK, you interrupted us. Uh, if anything else happened, uh, Python always has access to its original exception hook, its default one as sys.dunder accept hook. 
Uh, and so in your custom accept hook, you can just call that directly to sort of fall back to the normal behavior for, for cases that you're not prepared to deal with in your custom accept hook. And so that's what I've done here. There are, so there are, and then if, if we did find something we encounter, you know, we just print the exception and then exit one, and then actually set it as sys.accept hook. There are a million things you might want to customize here. You might want to customize the error message. You might want to customize the handling. You might uh, check whether or not a debug flag is set. And if it's set, don't set this as the accept hook. Just use Python's default one. Uh, the world is your oyster. Do whatever makes sense for you and your users. Uh, but hopefully, this is a useful illustration of the technique of both overriding sys.accept hook and co common things you might want to do in it, like writing new error messages or customizing the exit return code so it's not just always one. In this case, it is, but you could set whatever you wanted. Uh, so once we have that installed and we, we run again with the same bad input, uh, the output from our script will look more like this. We'll see the error from tar, and then there will be another error from your script specifically that says, OK, tar returned exit two. This, this is something that you know, if a user understands that they're extracting a tar archive, this is an error message that they can probably do something about. They're like, oh, that thing I thought was a tar archive apparently isn't. I need to go back and check and maybe give it a different input. So, so that's, that's something most users will, will find a lot more friendly. And so that, that's it. So there's just a few simple things that you can do in your Python script so that you can call shell commands and even orchestrate them into pipelines and get a lot of the user-friendly features of, of shell scripts as well. So you create pipelines by uh, creating chains of popen objects where the output of one popen object is connected to the input of another. Uh, you can extend popen objects uh, to do things like error checking. Uh, and potentially other cleanup as well to get sh uh, shell script behavior like set dash e. Uh, don't drop my water bottle. <laughs> uh, and, and you can uh, set your own accept hook so that when you get exceptions from this kind of error checking, uh, you can do more user friendly error reporting, something, something that's more useful to uh, non programmers uh, rather than just giving them the default Python traceback um, that they wouldn't know what to do about. So that's my talk. Thank you all very much. If you want to grab some of this code, I've got, so all the code that's been on these slides, I've got like, it's got nice doc strings and like, oh, it's so good. It's also, it shows you how to do Python 2 compatibility. It shows you how to do, um, it's got a couple extra features in there. I won't spoil the surprise. Uh, but go ahead and, and check out that code and, and you can just drop that right into your scripts and start using that today, hopefully. And if you have any questions or uh, I'll be around for the rest of the day and there's my contact information at the bottom. Thank you all very much. Oh, thanks, uh, thanks, Brett. Uh, here is your love.